The concept for EPAR trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for EPAR trade is actually quite obvious. Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At epartrade there is no e-commerce, it's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of EPAR trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. EPAR trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. Welcome to Race Industry Now, the technical and business webinar series from EPAR Trade, presented to you by ARP and Performance Plus Global Logistics. I am Francisque Savignon, the founder and CEO of EPAR Trade, the global platform for the performance and racing industry. This is episode 233, and we're going to be talking with Dave Cross from Materion, who is going to be sharing a lot of his knowledge with materials, so it's going to be very exciting. With me this morning are Judy Kin, the co-founder of ePortrait, our terrific host, Mr. Jeff Hammond. Judy, we've got some exciting news, right? This yes, week. we uh, put out a big announcement yesterday on our newsletter. I'm sure everybody saw it. Feed Sport News, Joe Tripp and Ralph Shaheen is now joining us in producing the third annual Race Industry Week. So we're proud of that. We're just all people that really get this industry. So it's a pleasure to be working with them on this. So on to you, Jeff. Well, thank you very much, Judy. Yeah, very exciting news there. Exciting to be able to uh, welcome, you know, Ralph Shaheen and his group in. Uh, Ralph, a longtime broadcaster and, and, I mean, supporter of racing across the board. So um, all I can say is uh, the party just gets bigger and better each and every year. And I'm excited about this upcoming industry week and it's you know what it's going to be here for you know it folks but the Absolutely. thing today is we're getting a chance to and i really appreciate uh francis getting this lined up uh for us to be able to welcome you know dave cruz here on our um, webinar today so he can share some information about his company and the future of the automobile industry across across the board i mean we talk about a lot of things being racing driven and this is exactly what it is i've looked at racing as a i guess you might say a tool to make the automotive industry better and in so many different ways so i'm really excited about him being here today Good morning dave morning jeff thank you thank you very much i'm excited to be here too this is uh well, well like i say i had the privilege of talking to you earlier this morning and um what you shared with me, I mean, it just made me that much more excited because of what you guys have, have really, you know, took a little chance on, on the racing industry to, to showcase what your company does, and they do it extremely well. And I think that a lot of the folks here today uh, will be equally as impressed as I was earlier, because as a racer, you know, you want to go faster, and you want to do it you know, better than anybody else. And usually to be able to do that, you've got to push the outer limits. And that means you got to go 
you got to spin the engine faster. You got to make it run hotter. You got to put it through a lot of basically torture to be able to wind up being on not being on being number one. And through that process, I mean, your company has jumped in here and said, look, we can make products that you can push it to the limit with heat and durability, and we can make it go faster and spin faster and with lighter material. Um, I think all of these things right here are music to engine builders and racers who really understand what it takes to go fast as through their ears. I mean, I, I Tell us more about your company, because like I say, I just can't wait to see what you got to show. All right. Well, I will get into, uh, I've got a little company overview in the presentation that I, I'm going to share with you. Uh, but just to let everybody know, you know, it's been over 40 years, Materion products have been used in racing. It's probably been about the last seven, eight years where we've, we've really started to focus a little bit more on it. And, you know, as a material supplier, um, we, we love the technology that racing brings. I mean, you, you, you always, as you say, pushing the limits of things. And then it, about 2014, 2015, we started to hear OEMs, you know, come calling us to talk about the materials we use for racing. And they're asking their, their OEM race teams, well, we're having problems because we got to make things we got to make things faster and and higher pressure. And you know what do what do you use? And they started a couple of cases. They said, um, "Go talk to Materia." So after hearing that, we said, "Well, wait a minute. We know that these materials work pretty well in racing. Let's see if we can demonstrate that in a way that people can actually you know get their hands on some data and know what know what the materials will do for them." Like I said, I think it sounds exciting, and I, th I think that you know, Materion is uh, going to wind up being on the uh, lips of a lot of people when we get through with this little pre presentation here in the next hour. I sure hope so. All right. Well, I think it's about time for me to start. There That's all right with everybody. So let me uh, see if Fire I can away. see if I can share the screen here and share, and then go. Bingo, looks good. All right, so if we can get, okay, there we go. See the full slide, not the presenter view. That's, a, that's always a good thing. Yep. So um, yeah, I've uh, these materials for improved performance, right? And this is engine testing results and uh, it's a lot of work. So I'm really happy to be able to be here and tell people about all of this, all this work we've done and the data that's come out of it. Uh, the first thing I like to do, because uh, you said Materion might be a household name after this, it certainly isn't right now, at least uh, some of you might know us, but some of you don't. So I'll give you a little overview on the company first. Um, you know, Materion's been, uh, well, we were, we were incorporated as the Brush Beryllium co Company in Cleveland in 1931 um, by our founder, Charles Brush II. It wasn't until 72 that we were publicly traded, and right now we're going to be about a billion, two billion, three uh, annual turnover. And we're worldwide, um, and, and most of the manufacturing of the products, in fact, all of the manufacturing of the products here is either done in England, the aluminum alloys that we're going to be talking, or aluminum composites, and uh, the, the other copper alloys uh, that we're mentioning are uh, made right in Ohio. So um, if you think about what Materion does, um, we make materials with great property combinations, like co combined properties that you don't get out of other materials. And they're usually materials that are difficult to make. And that's where our, that's where our niche is. So we have three, three divisions, three business units. Uh, one is the advanced materials unit, uh, sputter targets for microelectronics packaging, things like that, mostly precious metals. They do a great job handling precious, precious metals like gold, silver, platinum. Um, the performance alloys and composites, which is actually now performance materials recently. So the slide was not updated, but that's my division. That's where most of the racing materials go. That's where all the racing materials you're going to hear about come out of. Uh, that's the original beryllium uh, and or beryllium and composites business. Uh, we also make some clads and inlays, ceramics, a number of different things. And uh, there's a performance optics, uh, you know, that do. Uh, Thin films for optical coatings, uh, heads up displays and things like that would be something that you'd, you'd recognize. And if you look at where uh, we play in the right hand side of the, um, the right hand side of that slide, all of the different markets that we're in, um, you know, 
somebody it says that uh, when, wherever you are, you're six feet away from a spider, right? Um, you're less than six feet away from a material on material or you used one today. You start your car, you turn on your computer, you take a picture with your cell phone, land in a, a, a jet, go to pump gas, we're there. So uh, it's, it's one of those companies that you don't see much about us, but we touch just about everything you do. Um, so let's get right into the engine testing because that's the exciting part of all of this. And what we wanted to do was show that, you know, the goal was to show that you can really increase the performance uh, without making major modifications to the engine that you're using, right? And, and this is driven, as I said, the OEM, the OEM um, engineers were asking their race teams, what are you using? Because they need to build engines that are more efficient and, and emit less, right? Lower fuel consumption, lower CO2 emissions, but you can't put a, uh, you know, you, you don't want to sacrifice the performance of the engine because then you lose market share. So what do they do? They put more power into a smaller footprint. Well, it's essentially what racing is doing by getting the most power you can get out of the same size displacement, out of a fixed displacement. So that power density thing is what we're, what we're working on here. And our strategy, one thing's really easy. If you reduce the reciprocating mass, the moving components of the engine, uh, that means the engine is spending less energy moving its own parts and can put more out to the wheels, right? Also, when things get hotter, if you turbocharge or something like that, you got to get that heat distributed, put it in the right place. Sometimes you don't want it to leave, but you don't want to get hot spots. Sometimes you got to get it out of the combustion chamber. That's what our materials are there to do. And we had to prove that they have at least sufficient reliability. And Jeff, as you and I talked earlier today, I mean, even NASCAR, you can't rebuild the engine every race anymore. You need, you need more durability. Yes, out of it. And that's that we're seeing that everywhere. So we wanted to do, you know, upgrade the existing platforms with these great materials with property sets, good durability, and also because we'd like to see these in production engines, it can't be a major remanufacture. It, it's got to be close to a drop-in. You might have to, you know, adjust a few things around it, but try to get as close to drop-in replacement as possible. So there are two tests, uh, two sets of engine testing, and uh, that I'd like to tell you about. In there, each one has a white paper that I'll give the link to at the end. So I'm giving a high level overview. If you'd like more information on it or more in depth, just download the white paper from the from the Materion site. So at Cosworth in the UK, we took a had them take a 2.3 liter EcoBoost engine. The nice thing about that is it works on both sides of the Atlantic because it's in the Mustang four cylinder over over here, and it's the uh, Focus RS in Europe and to do an engine map and durability uh, test on it, changing and optimizing the components of the pistons, connecting rods, small end bearings, valve seats, and valve guides in the material on materials. And to show, um, and then the other test was with MXology. It's a startup company in the UK. We know the, the principles very well in it. And this is a much higher speed engine. I mean, double the RPMs at least, and, and um, with, with, a, with a lot shorter durability requirement. But they did all of the same components, slightly different material choices, also valve spring retainers and piston rings, which are not yet, uh, the testing isn't complete yet. But I'll give you a little bit of uh, background on those as well. So going to the 2.3 liter, the, the EcoBoost testing at Cosworth, um, we tried to get that 150 mile, 150,000 mile durability out of racing components in the engine with big changes to, that can make things a lot more efficient in the engine. So the Supreme X is, I'll tell you more about it in a minute. It's a metal matrix composite aluminum that uh, was used for the rods and the pistons. We had our tough met alloy in the, uh, in the small end bearing. Uh, and Performat, which many of the people on the call will recognize, was used for the valve seats and the valve guides. And the whole idea was to, can we reduce the fuel consumption? How much can we reduce the fuel consumption, which will reduce the emissions? Can we manage the heat better with, with the Performat, with the higher, higher conductivity materials? And just in the design, the mass of the piston, the 
pin in the rod was reduced 30%. I mean, that's more than one cylinder piston pin and rod. Um, mm -hmm. And even back in 1920, the president of Sunbeam Motors said an ounce off the piston is worth 112 pounds, if I uh, paraphrase that, off the chassis. And we all know that because that piston is moving back and forth at uh, awfully high speed. So the materials we've used, excuse me, come on. The materials uh, are our Supreme X 225 CA and the 225 stands for 2000 series aluminum with 25% silicon carbide. Um, those of you who, you know, 20 years ago, uh, know uh, metal matrix composites with silicon carbide, they were big hunks of silicon carbide. They were whiskers and things. These are very fine three micron diameter particles that our process, our proprietary process distributes evenly throughout the material. Mm -hmm. um, it was used, this material was used before, uh, before they regged out of Formula One, it was used as Formula One pistons. And it is now a uh, first, first road car use of it is the hypercar, the Gordon Murray T50 is using, uh, <clears throat> Cosworth is putting the uh, Supreme X225CA in there. So compared to aluminum alloys, it's a whole heck of a lot stiffer. It's got 60% higher fatigue strength at temperature, which allows a lot of design changes to a piston. And it's about the same density. It's also got a lower coefficient of thermal expansion. So the starting clearances can be a lot tighter. You don't have to worry about it expanding out, say, into a bore. Um, versus steel, it's specific stiffness. So that's the stiffness divided by the density. It's 50% higher than steel. You can <clears throat> theoretically make a, a component, same as steel, uh, you know, to do the same job as steel, be half the weight. And 30% specific strength. Um, their performant alloy, the next one, is it's a copper alloy, mostly copper, with its soup, it's copper soup, Cro copper, nickel, silicon, chromium, zirconium. Um, it is used now in valve guides and valve seats, NASCAR, NHRA, IndyCar. Um, Total Seal offers it as a uh, piston ring material as well. Um, the uh, versus other bronzes, it's a whole heck of a lot stronger. It's harder, and it's got a strength retention at temperature that rivals, you know, everything. Our best beryllium copper alloy is a shade better, I can say. And versus iron-based, um, standard iron-based materials that are used in production automotive, it's three times more thermally conductive. It moves the heat three times faster. Got the same hardness, and it's also uh, not as stiff as the iron. So for a mating component like the head of the valve, it cushions it a little bit. It's, it's much gentler on it. Um, and then our tough met is the last thing. That's a copper nickel tin alloy. Um, Boeing and Airbus use it in their landing gear. It's specified. Uh, that's why I say when you land in, in a plane, that main, and main landing gear in a lot of their planes is in tough met. Uh, because it can, uh, you know, it's got low friction, it can take a whole lot of pressure, and it bounces back very nicely. Um, we have tested it versus the copper beryllium that's standard in a lot of racing engines, small end bearings, and it works just the same. It works just as well as that. It actually has lower friction, the wear rate's about the same, and it is monolithic. It's not a coated material, so you can't wear through a coating and come up with a steel backing where, where the disaster happens. It's a slow uniform wear rate. So let's talk about the design changes that we did at, uh, at, at Cosworth or at Cosworth do for us. Um, so the OE piston for, for this uh, 2.3 liter EcoBoost is a cast piston with a cast iron ring groove insert in it for, for durability. And with the uh, redesigned piston in Supreme X, uh, we, may, we maintain the OEM crown and bowl geometry just because we know Ford had put a lot of work into this. This is a very mature engine platform and they've done, they've done quite a bit of work on it. So we didn't want to mess with that. Uh, the skirt was able to be modified. It could be, it, it's stiffer and stronger. It's got a lower CTE coefficient of thermal expansion. So the, sh the skirt could be shorter and thinner than, than the OE. The uh, pin bosses were shortened and actually made it into a, uh, a piston guided rod rather than crank guided rod. Supreme X runs very well on itself. And actually I've got the two pieces here, but you can see that they kind of, they meet very tightly on, on the top end and it ran. Mm -hmm. These are the ones from the testing, not too much wear on either of those. 
So um, we also, because of not having the ring groove insert in there, which adds about 20 grams to the piston because of the difference in density from the cast iron to the aluminum, we were able to move the groove up quite a bit and get rid of crevice volume, which theoretically should increase your, uh, your efficiency, decrease fuel consumption, because whatever gets down in the crevice doesn't get burned. Um, so the design changes, as you can see on the right now, unfortunately they're flipped, the OE piston is on the left, but it's, it's significantly shorter, um, shorter skirt and everything. There was molly coat put on that skirt of the Supreme X piston. You can see it on the, on the one that came out of testing there. Um, and as I said, the, the pin was much shorter, but overall those two numbers in, uh, in yellow on the, uh, on the table there, 20 percent, nearly 20 percent reduction in piston and pin mass with the shorter pin and and the lighter much lighter piston and uh, we forged the piston directly as much to shape as possible mmc's are a little bit difficult to machine so if you can save yourself hog some time hogging out the undercrown by machining or forging it to near net shape uh that's that's always a good idea and the other thing is the crevice volume was a 60 percent reduction so getting that getting that ring that much higher um, and that, that should, you know, that's a desirable thing to do for any engine that brings, uh, that brings the top ring closer to the crown to allow heat to get out, not having the cast iron ring groove insert takes, uh, you know, allows you to be, you're conducting basically through aluminum. So it's much more conductive right. than the cast iron. And just to note that the aluminum groove was not anodized. It wasn't protected at all. This is just machine, uh, mm -hmm. machine Supreme X. The big change was the connecting rod. And, um, you know, the OE rod was forged steel. It had your traditional multi-layer big end bearing and a bronze small end bearing. And it was, it was crank guided. Um, and it, uh, and so, we made the uh, Materion one, uh, the Supremax one, out of plate. The reason for plate is it just, we weren't making enough to justify forge tool. You could forge it to size, forge it to near net size, but <clears throat> for availability, just at the time, we cut it out of plate. It is thicker. It looks more like a, <clears throat> I hear the two parts there. It looks more like a titanium rod than a steel rod. Um, and it was, uh, there is a tough mat bearing in there. You can also see this maybe a little bit easier there, or you can see the step on the photo to the right, <clears throat> that right. it's thinner at the top for the, uh, for the piston guiding. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Cosworth did, just to be careful, it's because like titanium, it's a little more notch sensitive than the steel. They were a little bit worried about the bolt thread pitch in the threads. They adjusted those to increase the durability. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> the net though was a 41% reduction in mass. That's a whole wow. heck of a lot of mass out of the rod. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and that's huge. Yes. Yes, sir. We, uh, had to increase the length of the rod slightly just to get the compression height to be the same with the shorter piston. Uh, but again, that's 1.37 kilograms. That's a whole lot of weight out of uh, reciprocating mass out of it. One of the things we didn't do was rebalance the engine. So it was noisy. There's no doubt about it. And you can see if you get the white paper, there's a, a, there's a discussion of <clears throat> taking off the balance shaft. What could you do with the balance shaft? How does it compare to a two liter EcoBoost without a balance shaft and the out of balance horses, all of those things. But one of the things we did want to quantify was how much could you take off the crankshaft? <clears throat> Excuse me, how much of the counterbalance you take off the crankshaft? So this is theoretical, we didn't do it, but the Cosworth engineers took a look and by maintaining the overall system inertia, there's a lot on here, you don't have to read it, but by maintaining the overall system inertia, you could have taken out 718 grams, nearly two pounds off the crankshaft. So no. that is, I'm sorry. That's unheard of. It's 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 a nice little change if you can do it. Yeah. Yep. So uh, so let's get into the testing now. And <clears throat> so this is the engine map in uh, in, in pressure versus speed. The uh, the blue and red blue with red circles is the the full load curve that they ran. There were some OE reference points, just things that they've done for other OEMs at Cosworth. 
The WTL or LTP is a European uh, emissions test sites. They, they test at those sites and there's some, uh, some other points that they put in. So what we did was had them test, the, you know, baseline the engine with, a, with as is, and then put in the material and components and test it again versus that and see what the changes are. So the next map I'm gonna show you is the reduction in, in fuel consumption. All right, so test two is the material on engine two minus one being the baseline means a negative number is a reduction in, in fuel consumption, All right? And we've got a one and a half, one, one and a half in some places, um, you know, not bad for just drop in. That's, that's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. There were some things that we didn't expect. We expected to see more than that, you know, because of the, uh, because of the changes to the crevice volume and some other things, but, you know, the, the hydrocarbon emissions just didn't change, so or appreciably changed. So that meant that that bold design and the injection profile that Ford has refined for a long time was pretty darn good because they're probably not getting much fuel into the crevice. So reducing right. the crevice volume doesn't help that much. We know it helps in other places, so it was still worth still worth doing and proving. And no change to the knock limit. We couldn't see it. We actually ran for a short period of time some uh, performat rings in there as well. So the higher conductivity piston rings, that's in the that's in the white paper. You could read it. It didn't show uh, any effect on knock mitigation at all. But okay. from what we've heard from other testing, those rings do have an effect on can have an effect on knock uh, knocking by cooling the crown. So other testing, as I say, has shown benefits in the in the null areas. So what we did after that was see, well, will it last? How long can this stuff last? Is this good enough? Uh, are these racing materials good enough to run for OEM durability lifetime? And Cosworth picked a brutal durability test to put on this. So they replaced all the material on parts and had a new block to start fresh. And this test is 150 hours and it told, totals greater than 96 hours at, uh, at wide open throttle. So you run for about 15 minutes at idle and then hit wide open throttle maximum torque for 13 minutes, then do another 12, 13 minutes at max power and then drop down to 90% of max power to, to go through the cycle and repeat that 225 times. It's a brutal test for an engine and not something you would put racing materials through normally and expect them to mm -hmm. make it. Um, I've got 350 slides of data if anybody wants to see them, but they all look like these curves that run straight across and nothing really happens. Aside from the two times they blew the head gasket and you can see some pressure drop when that happens as you would imagine. First time the head gasket was, but that, that's an indication that we were running the engine really hard, of course. Right. And the first, first time it blew, they were able to resurface the, uh, resurface the block. Second time, Fortunately, it was near the end of the test. There wasn't enough stock left on the block to resurface it. So they just lowered the pressure and limped through the final hours of the testing. But the interesting thing is what happened afterwards. The, uh, the durability or the, the engine strip, um, valve seats and valve guides were just no change. And we hadn't run these materials. These materials run all the time in, in racing engines, never run them this long. And you could see they're actually shiny in, in some of the cases on the, uh, on the valve uh, seats. You can't see the guides that well. Um, the maximum recession they could measure was one to two microns, essentially nothing. Um, the uh, no signs of additional leakage or wear. There was a little crust buildup in one case where they got a little leakage, but once that came off, it was, it was fine. And nowhere on the valve. So the valves didn't do any worse for having these, these high durability, actually it probably did a little bit better, as I said, because they're more, um, they should be gentler than an iron-based material. Um, to look at the pistons, um, pistons actually condition was fantastic. If you go to the white paper, you can see the hardness retention. It was really, really good uh, over the time. Little discoloration on the crown, as I mentioned, and you can see it right here as well. That's one of the pistons from the test. A little bit of wear, that's the, that's the opposite side, the thrust side. You can see just a little bit of wear if I put it in the light the right way there, um, mm -hmm. of the molly coat. But the, um, the only thing we noticed was that the top groove went out of flatness a little bit. And working with Cosworth and our, and our brilliant engineers over in, uh, over in the UK where this Supreme X is made, 
we figured uh, that there just needs to be an intermediate heat treatment. You rough it first, do a heat treatment, and then finish machine it. And that's, that's it. Uh, that is actually what is, uh, you know, that, that actually led them to being able to put this material into the, uh, the T-50, the uh, Gordon Murray T-50, which is a 12,000 RPM, 600 and some horsepower, naturally aspirated engine. Uh, for, for those of you who haven't seen the, um, the YouTube video series with Dario Franchitti uh, following this through its, through its production, uh, that's that's really fun to watch, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I'd recommend, especially I think it's number nine, where he hears it on the dyno hit twelve thousand the first time. That is a really cool sound. Um, so the uh, the one thing we noticed was that the cast iron OE rings actually wore against the Supremax. So that was a little bit of a, a little bit of a worry. The the thing is though, we've never seen them wear against uh, tool steel rings, chrome steel rings. DLC coated or um, uh, chrome nitrided. There's there's no ring wear. The other thing, if you have to use a, uh, a, a cast iron ring, maybe a little bit better betting in practice. A tungsten disulfide coating on it or some red, a little bit more red grease might have done it. So we weren't expecting that. It's just uh, note that you know you need a hard ring to run against that that surface. Um, the Surprising thing though, again, was the rods. The rods looked great. The rods were straight, the rods didn't wear. There was a little bit of fretting on the back end and that's because the coefficient of thermal expansion of, of the aluminum metal matrix composite, the Supremex is a little bit larger than that of, is a bit larger than that of steel. And so it moved away from the big end bearing a little bit and allowed it to vibrate. We've talked to bearing manufacturers since and a properly tolerance bearing would not have had that, that problem. So it's easy enough to solve the problem. Uh, the, uh, and the and the bearing in, this I've got here, can't see it there. You can only see a little bit where it says thrust side, like right over there. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, maybe you can't, but that middle picture on the right shows a little bit of burnishing. There was almost no wear at all. So things went very smoothly for this. And we were, we were very pleased with all of the, uh, all the end results. Um, so from there, I think I can move on to the MXology testing and talk a little bit about doing some stuff at higher speed in an engine that's uh, one tenth the size almost. Um, so MXology, as I said, it's a it's a new company in the UK. started uh, started last year by two fellows who we've done a lot of work with in the past, Scott Breda and and Mark Yates. And uh, I think my let me try that. Um, they they build these motocross supercross engines you can buy them right off their site you can buy also kits to convert your engine into those you know, buy the parts from them but the engines are modular and you can have the engine that actually ran in supercross and put it on your kawasaki 250 if you want and they also have other other oe um, engines so um scott who is a consultant of ours as well came to us in uh, about this time last year and said, hey, we want to get this stuff ready and we want to put your materials into our Supercross engine. But that starts in January in Anaheim and we don't have a lot of time and we're a startup. So we agreed to give them some, uh, to give them the materials and some funding in exchange for all of their data and comparative data, which is in the white paper that, uh, that, you, can, that you can download for us. So, um, they needed to increase both the performance and the durability. Of course, performance, but they also want the durability because they're selling these engines and having them not need to be rebuilt as often as the OE engines or their competitors is a big benefit to them. So there's a slew of changes that they made and we'll take a little time on this slide because it's a lot of information. Um, the piston, which was a cast aluminum piston um, before is now our 4632 alloy. And, Thing is, I'll say about 4632, in a lot of classes of racing, metal matrix composites are not allowed. You can't use them in Formula One, you can't use them in IndyCar, there's other places where they're, they're not allowed in the engine, at least in the current versions of things. Uh, 4632 is a hyper, hyper eutectic. It's 23% silicon in, in aluminum. And <clears throat> because of that, it's allowed in all classes of racing. And the reason 
reason that uh, MXology chose to use this uh, material is, I mean, this is this is the piston. You can see it down there. It, there's not much to it. It's and the OE piston is awfully thin itself, so they couldn't take much mass out of it by having it stronger with Supremex. And 4632 machines a lot more easily than Supremex. So from a cost perspective, to get more durability in the piston with uh, um, with the minimum amount of cost, they went with the 4632. And their their target was a big increase in lifetime. The Conrad was Supremex though, because uh, that's a little bit different situation than uh, we, don't, we haven't used 4632 Conrad. Um, one of the things, and instead of a 41%, which we got in the uh, EcoBoost, this was a 34% decrease in, in mass. And uh, the reason it wasn't ready to run um, is you could see down on the, um, the picture of the Conrad down there that there's a one piece big end bearing. Well, the OE big end bearings, and I've got one here, you probably can't see it, but there's a seam in there. It's a two piece big end, but it's a one piece rod. So you don't need a two piece. Thing is, as I mentioned, Supremex like uh, titanium can be a little bit notch sensitive compared to steel. So with the uh, uh, two piece bearing, there's a chance for scratching as you push it in on both sides. The one piece doesn't scratch. So you can see the scratches, pictures of the scratches in the white paper. And that one piece bearing, which I believe uh, Mala supplied to them is uh, with, a, with a copper alloy backing is very gentle on its way in and does a much better job. Um, the valve spring retainer um, took a lot of mass out of that too, 30% of, out of the mass, which allows a higher red line. We'll talk about that later. The valve seats they chose to perform at, same, same material as, as we did in the Cosworth testing. And, uh, from experience, uh, Scott had used Toughmet, our Toughmet alloy, the same thing that was in the small end in the Cosworth testing, use that for the valve for the valve guide. Um, it is at low speeds and or at high speeds and low loads. Toughmet and Performat run about just exactly the same. If it gets hot, Performat's better. If it gets to really high loads, Toughmet's better for so a valve guide. The reason you would use a Performat valve guide over a Toughmet valve guide is if you're getting um, say you have a, a sodium filled valve and you're actually moving some heat up the stem, then you need to get that out and having a higher con conductivity of the performat is, is a benefit. Um, the piston ring, they ran the piston, they are running the piston rings now. So we don't have piston ring data. There was a coding problem with the piston rings that has been solved. Um, actually the manufacturer put the wrong coding on. So they weren't ready in time, but they're running right now, just like the, uh, uh, the ring or the um, um, rods, sorry, and uh, and the small end bushing was in tough men, and you could see there that it's got a little flange on the outside because again, this is a uh, um, piston guided rod, and when they go together like that, now you've got a forty six thirty two piston on a Supremex rod, and the piston's a little softer, so to keep them apart. They put that little flange of tough mat in there. So it's actually a two piece small end bearing where the flange comes in from both sides. Um, so let's talk about this piston material because I pulled a switcheroo and we've got a different piston material in there. Um, it is, as I said, 23% um, silicon hyperutectic. It's made by our, our powder metallurgy process that distributes the silicon very finely. If you look at the microstructure, and I think that's in the, uh, um, I think that's in the white paper, you'll see that the cast, a 21% cast hyperutectic, has blobs of silicon in places where it's a really fine distribution, which is one of the reasons the the properties are, are are much better in the 4632. So, in comparison, the things that you'll notice make 4632 desirable is the stiffness, the elastic modulus is a lot higher than either the cast hyper eutectic or the standard 2618 that you use. Uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion is lower than both, so you can have a tighter starting clearance. Again, it's not to where Supremex is, but <clears throat> it offers you, you know, better machinability than the Supremex. And the fatigue strength, fatigue strength over density is, you know, nearly double of what the cast hyper eutectic has. And, and about 50% more than the 2618. So it's a very, very good piston alloy. 
uh, it's not quite Supremax. So uh, notable improvements that they saw, um, they got 26 hours or 28 hours out of the out of the pistons. And the OEMs all say 10 hours. And when you talk to the racers, they say it might be more like six or eight hours. Out of the so we're getting, you know, three to four times the life out of the piston. And it's consistent through the races. That's the other thing the riders have said that when, when the other piston materials start to go, you can tell. You can actually feel it through the race that you're starting to lose some, lose some pressure. Um, so this is a selling point. It, it, it's great for the racer themselves. And then it's a selling point for MXology because they can say you don't have to rebuild this engine as often. Um, the connecting rods are running now in, in testing and they're showing a one to 2% increase in performance versus the OEM. Uh, the retainers, just taking that little bit out of the retainer mass gave them an 800 RPM increase uh, because before valve flow. And the, uh, the seats and guides are doing what they expected. Just lasting as, lasting as long as you think they would. Um, to talk about the retainers, so the Supreme X retainers, you'll notice that that's 225XF. That means extra fine. So the silicon carbide particles in 225CA are three microns. We found that at three microns, sometimes it scratches the top of the spring, which isn't a good thing. 225XF is 0.7 micron particle size, and that made the wear go away. So even finer, um, but it's still a 25% um, silicon carbide. You can make it 30% lighter than titanium, 70% lighter than steel. And that means, as, as you know, if you, can if you can lighten any part of the valve, um, the valve train or the, the, the valve itself, the valve assembly, valve and spring assembly, you can get higher RPMs before you hit flow. And so, as you can see, compared to titanium and steel, the density is fractional. I mean, it's, it's a lot less, a lot lower density than either of them. Um, the, uh, the elastic modulus, it's stiffer. This material is stiffer than titanium. Now, you still have to beef it up a little bit for strength reasons, for the fatigue, uh, but also it has a very low coefficient of friction. So it reduces the drag on the top of the spring. And um, you'll see on the next page that how, how they got a little bit thicker. We have two case studies already that are on the Materion website about this. One is one of the first iterations of this engine was... Um, was the Revo Husqvarna. So now, now their current is the Revo 7 Kawasaki team that was in, in Supercross. The Revo Husqvarna team from previously, both Mark and, and Scott were, uh, you know, designed the engines, designed and tested the engines for that. They took 3.6 grams out of their retainer going from steel to uh, Supreme X. And there's where the 800 RPM came in. The MXology engines are getting about the same thing. You could notice on the right that, okay, so that is the OE, the steel retainer on the left, top and bottom, and the Supreme X on the right. And you can see it's a little bit beefier, uh, but still quite a bit lighter. And just to see what would happen on a lower RPM engine, um, in our factory in Elmore, Ohio, not that far from Toledo, uh, one of our electricians, Steve Rando, drives a 305 sprint car. And uh, Scott made the, the retainers for him, outfitted his engine with it. And he got at about half the RPMs, about half the increase uh, before he hit redline. And he's noticing the power of the engine. And he said they're lasting quite a long time. So we're, we're, we're very pleased that, uh, you know, we can show it in uh, not only, not only uh, does it help in, in very high revving engines, more in high revving engines as you would, under, as you would expect, even at something that's a 7,200 7, RPM red line. So here's what Scott had to say about, about this. I mean, he's been using 2618 forever. Um, he says mm -hmm. it's a much better alloy, um, no advantage to 2618. He's, uh, he's completely sold on it. Um, he said, because of uh, better fatigue strength, you can make it lighter than the 2618. The wear resistance is better. The grooves in that, again, are unanodized, unprotected. Um, and he said it machines just as well as, as any uh, hyper eutectic material or close to a 2618. And so this is a ringing endorsement. I won't read everything he said, but uh, he's very, very pleased with it. Uh, so let's talk about the results in racing that, uh, that they've had. Um, 
So Dylan Walsh started. He'd been re- racing motocross. This was his first Supercross season. Uh, right. And, you know, while he was adapting to the Supercross, one of the things that everyone noticed is how fast this thing started. And from Dirt Hub, you know, the power rocketed Walsh into the lead at the start of the race. Right? Mm-hmm. It's a very, very zippy engine. And he finished 11th and 13th in, uh, in his first season. Overall, 19th with missing two races. Um, unfortunately, the one I went to see, his ankle was swelled up like a balloon, so I never got to see him <laughs> race. But yeah. if you want to hear about the elevator speech that I gave at that, you can go on the YouTube channel and check it out. There's a, there's a uh, nice YouTube thing following uh, um, Dylan. And I'm pointing out that uh, that's one of the first uh, team shirts that has Materion on it. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, and it made the cover story on race engine technology. So uh, that is the high level of our uh, of our testing, a high level overview. I'd like to give you a few links to follow that you can come back to. Hopefully, if you watch this, if not, I've got my email address at the end of this. Any questions, just shoot me an email. Okay. I'll send you these links and things. So we have a tech service line, and these these are phenomenal people you actually have a real engineer on the end of the line and when it says talk to an engineer you email and an engineer show an engineer gets it at his desk and responds usually same day there's also a uh, request for quote form at at that point on the website if you're not located in the u.s we've got international sales offices in uh, in stuttgart in the uk and all over asia um and there's where the white papers are uh, for the for the Cosworth white paper. You you have to give us a name, but the Mixology white paper is free to download. Uh, the other thing that we're working on is you know we're we're a mill, and uh, we we like to sell lots of things, uh, lot lots of material at once. Uh, we're put, putting some distributors into place so that they can you know respond better to somebody, a small engine builder who wants one piece of something. Uh, you know, you don't call a steel mill for a piece of rod like that. You call a distributor. So we've got two distributors that are going into place. Um, one is Edro, who is already a distributor of ours for the plastic injection mold tooling. Edro serves the industry, the racing industry with their steels. So it was a nice fit for them to take this on. And there's their contact information, Edro and Schomburg. And then if you've sourced materials in the UK or Europe, you probably know Smith's High Performance. Uh, they're out of Biggles Wade in the UK, and they've been in the industry for a long time. They're also stocking up with our materials, should be ready in the first quarter of next year. Last thing I'd like to do really quickly is just thank the people at Cosworth. Boy, they, I mean, I know we paid them for this, but they really put their heart and souls into this, especially Dave Good and Andy Egger. Um, and, you know, MXology, those are guys are great to work with, great partners to have, and I can't name the people at material on too many of them and you know the 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 oscars music will start playing and i don't want somebody to, have to pull me off the stage so um <laughs> and, and and i really want to thank you know you jeff and the people at epart trade for for having given us this opportunity to talk about all of what we've done so uh, well that's about it there's my email address if anybody who needs to talk to me well dave i mean i think it's outstanding i mean uh being a racer i mean you went to a really great group right there with cosworth i mean their reputation um has been long known and they're very thorough about what they do so when they sit there and say this did your product did this and did that i mean as you and i talked earlier this this has got a wow factor that should send ripples across those who are interested in lighter more durable and a better product across the board. I mean, you have given them the opportunity now to reach out to your company and, and get some of the benefits that you, you presented in front of them. I mean, you've already, you know, you've created it, you've already tested it, you got the numbers to back it up. Uh, I mean, that's that speaks volumes, at least in my book, that once we get in bed with you guys, we can make whatever we wanna do much better. And, and I really appreciate the time and, and the effort that you put into this presentation myself. I mean, um, hopefully, you know, I said this when we got done this morning, I'm hoping we can turn this into material wind up being a household discussion in a lot of companies from here on out because of what you've done today. Uh, we'd love that, you know, and, and this is it's it's not only like high technology stuff, but this mm-hmm. is a lot of fun. 
I mean, because you get to yeah. actually see it happen on the track. That is that is really cool. Well, I mean, when you show that all of a sudden you know, you change the retainer, you did this, you did this with the piston, and you're seeing RPM gains, you're seeing you know reduction in, in uh, spinning, you know, uh, crank weight, and what you can do and what the future holds. Um, I mean, you know yourself, Cosworth is an outstanding company, but there's other companies out there equally as outstanding that, you know, you give me a little something like this, we'll make our product even better than what it is. So uh, I think that's exciting. And I think it's uh, it's what really Epartrate, uh, working with companies like yourself, this is what this uh, webinar is all about. It's show and tell. And you have definitely showed and, and, and told the story, I think very eloquently today, with uh, with great uh, great numbers and statistics, that's what I love about it. You can back everything up, and I think that's wonderful. It, thank you, thank you very much. Jeff. That's that's great to hear. Yeah, T terrific presentation, Dave. Thank you so much, and so so well prepared. And uh, yeah, that, you're absolutely right, Jeff. That's what this whole webinar series is about. So thank you so much for sharing so much knowledge and so much information. This webinar has been recorded. It will be posted later on the ePortrait platform and distributed through a newsletter and a different media channel. Thank you very much for being with us today. We will be back next week. We're going to be talking engine management system with Haltech Engine Management System, one of the pioneer uh, company in uh, EFI. So it's going to be very exciting. So thank you very much. We pushed uh, uh, Dave's and Matarium's product back on the homepage of ePortrait. So we build this platform for you, for the industry. So take advantage of it. Look at uh, Matarium's profile on the ePortrait platform, and you'll be able to connect with Dave and his team. So thank you very much. Let's go racing, and we'll be back next week live at 9 a.m. Pacific. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Registering on ePartrade is easy. To start, click on the Join for Free button on the homepage. First, search your company to see if it's already in our database. If you see your company on the list, click on it to select it. Then, choose Claim Company if you are one of the decision makers, an owner, marketing person, or main company contact. Or choose Join Company if you are an employee, and press Continue. If you couldn't find your company in our database, select Register a New Company. On the following page, fill out your name, email, phone number, job title, and choose a secure password. If you chose Register a New Company, you'll need to choose your business type. Select Supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose Racing Business if you're looking to source new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose Race Team if you own or are a member of a professional race team. Then, enter your company name. Please provide a website, Facebook page, or LinkedIn if you have one, and choose to either claim or join the company. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Finally, click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. An email will be sent to your inbox. Please confirm your email address and you will be approved shortly. Welcome to ePartrade.